In this tutorial, we're going to create these retro style titles in After Effects. How is it going guys and welcome to the Olufemi channel. We're a group of teachers that want to shore up your video production skills in as little time as possible. G'day guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Nick. Today we are going to go through After Effects 2022 from a beginner's perspective. Now, I've had 25 years using After Effects and it is a very quirky program, so I completely understand as a beginner why it's a little bit daunting. So I wouldn't suggest doing the videos all in one go. It's broken up into a few modules. So I would suggest learning a bit of it, going away, coming back and doing another bit another day or another time. It's completely up to you. All right, guys, let's dive straight into it right now. And this video is brought to you by Envato Elements. More about that later. All right, guys, so when you open up After Effects for the first time, this is the window that you're going to get. We're just going to skip right past this menu and go straight for new project. And for those playing at home, this is version 22.4. It might be a little bit different to previous versions, so just be aware. You should have this project window here. If you can't find it, just go to window and then go to workspace and then go to default. Now, just to quickly zoom over the rest of the windows, this is the composition window where you'll do most of your work. And this is the timeline window, which is very similar to Premiere. Basically, you'll put all your layers in here and mark around with them as you see fit. On the right hand side, you've got a whole bunch of tools. And on the top row is a whole bunch of toolbars as well. Now, you can go right click in this window here where it says project and go new composition. And you will get this new window called the composition settings window. A composition basically is a video uh, canvas that you can work in, sort of like a new sequence if you like. So here we go, we're going to select, uh, it doesn't really matter what this is, but we're going to make this 1920 by 1080, lock the aspect ratio, we're going to make sure it's square pixels. Uh, we're going to make the frame rate 2397, uh, full res, uh, start time cone will be zero, if you want to just type in zero in there. And then we can make this composition five seconds. So I'm going to type five zero zero, which means five seconds and then zero zero frames. And our background will be black. So, and let's call this one background because that's what we're going to start with first. So here we are, this is our composition. We're going to jump straight into it. So we're going to create our mountains first. So let's go up here to this first tool. And this is the pen tool up here. So we're going to click that. And we're just going to select the fill and click on the word fill and select solid fill. And then we're going to go, okay, make sure that's hundred percent. And it'll give you a color, which is red. Now we're actually going to turn the stroke off. It should be off by default, but just in case it's not click on the word stroke and then we'll click that off and then go, okay. Now let's change the color of the mountain. Let's make it a really dark, dark purpley kind of color like this. And there we go. So let's, draw some straight lines. So here we go. We'll click one there and I'm just clicking to create points. You can do this as slow or as fast as you want. And I'm just going to hold down shift to give myself a straight line and then connect them up and fill in the, uh, the path. And there we go. We've got a filled in path. Now you can always go through and move these points around after the fact. So that's not a problem at all. And there we go. We've created our first mountain range. If you don't like the shape of them, you can actually hold down command or control and click on these things. And you can actually move the points after the fact. Or if you want to be a bit more savvy, you can actually highlight this in the timeline, twirl down, go to contents, go to shape, and then go to the path and you can select them there as well. All right, let's create a background. So we're going to create a, a gradient from the top to the bottom. So what we're going to do here is select this tool, which is the rectangle tool. It's right next to the, the shape tool here. We're going to select that and make sure without anything selected, because if you have this selected, you're just going to draw onto the same shape tool, but we want to create a new instance of a shape. So make sure that is not selected. So click anywhere except that shape. Now let's change the fill to a gradient, which is this one here. Click OK. Now let's draw our rectangle just around this, just like this. So it fills the whole screen. You just drag it out, holding down the button. Right now you can see the gradient is not very nice. It's actually very, very small and we'll show you why. So if you highlight, if you, it'll actually highlight that rectangle, but if you can't find it again, just twirl down and then twirl down and then twirl down to the rectangle and you'll see it's there. Now, if we get to the rectangle and we got a rectangle path, um, you can see nothing happens. And what we need to do is we need to highlight this, the selection tool, and that'll bring up the gradient markers here. And as you can see, as we start pulling these around, uh, it'll actually tell you where the gradient is. 
where it starts and where it finishes. So this is the start point, and this is the end point. And obviously where you set the start and end points will determine where or which direction the gradient will go, or if you want it to be a bit more, you know, in the middle here like this, you can do it like that as well. But in this case, we want to go from top to bottom because we're trying to mimic a sunrise. So here we go. Now that gradient is not very nice because we want it to be more of a retro style color. So we'll right, we'll just click in here, not right click, just click in here. And we'll select the top color. Uh, we'll make it sort of a purpley, also kind of a purpley, bluey hue, very dark bluey hue. And the bottom one, we'll make it a little bit more magenta, almost. So maybe a bit more like that, like a pinky, pinky hue. You can make it more orangey if you like, because uh, that'll also give you a bit of a magenta look as well. As you can see, they do mix. So there we go. Now we'll pull this layer below the mountain ranges we just created. And there we go. We've got that nice background going there as well. Now it's important to label these things as Herman would say, so here we go. Press enter on the keyboard to bring up this uh, prompt so we can start naming things. And so we'll call this sky. And likewise, we'll go to the top shape layer and we'll type enter and we'll call this mountain and press enter to make sure that takes and we'll tool these back up so we can see what's going on. And there we go, that is it for the mountain and the sky. Now, if you don't like where the gradient is or where it's sitting, um, again, make sure with the arrow tool selected up here, let's go to the rectangle path and you can see we've got these here. So if you wanna pull this up so it's a little bit higher, like the sunrise is a little bit higher and maybe pull this down so this is a little bit lower, you can do that to taste as well. Now let's create a sun. So we're gonna go up here to this thing, which is also the shape tool. Now you did draw a rectangle with that, but also you can draw other shapes. So if you hold down, you can actually get a whole bunch of other shapes as well. In this case, we're gonna select the circle tool. So let's go in here and let's also select, make sure we've also got the gradient selected as well. You should already have it selected, but we've already created a gradient from before. So let's draw a circle. Now, as you draw the circle, you can see here it gets a bit wonky and it's a little bit hard to actually get it to be a perfect circle. But fear not, if you hold down shift, you can actually get a perfect circle every time. So let's hold down shift as we drag it out and we get that perfect circle. There we go. All right, let's rename this sun. Now we're gonna make this also a gradient as well. So let's go back to the arrow tool and go back and reselect this. And as you can see our and if we go down and select the ellipse tool, we can actually see that we get the gradient markings again. Again, if you can't seem to find these gradient markings, you can go to the gradient fill and you can see here there are started endpoints under the ellipse tool. Uh, started endpoints, if you want to do this manually as well, you can muck around with it in here. But I find doing this is a little bit more intuitive. So I'm going to do it in here on the composition window itself. All right. Let's click on this. And let's select the colors as well. We'll make this a little bit more like an orangey color, a really bright orangey color. And the top one, we'll make it like a really bright yellow, you know. We're gonna bring this sun behind the mountain just so that it's sort of, you know, in the right place. So there we go. Just position it as you like. You can just use the arrow tool up here if you're not sure what's going on. But this arrow tool will allow you to drag things around as you like. So now we're gonna create the grid for the floor. Now at the moment, just to explain what's happened here, we've created vector objects uh, similar to Illustrator in uh, After Effects itself. So, but in this case, we're gonna create a new object in what I'm doing and right click in this empty space here and I'm gonna go new solid. Alternatively, you can come up here and go layer new solid or command or control Y, whatever you like. It doesn't matter what color it is, but 1920 by 1080, if you're not sure, just press make comp size. Um, we're gonna rename this as grid, make comp size, and then we'll press okay. Now what solid will come on top, which is you know not very exciting, but that is okay. Now let's go over to this thing called the effects and presets panel. Like I said, if you can't find where that is, you can either go and select this to the workspace to default under window. Alternatively, you can come down here and go to the effects and presets panel, which is just here and that'll just bring that up for you. Now, all the effects here are searchable, so you can just type in what you need. Alternatively, you can just go in here and actually just twirl down and see what kind of effects you like if you just wanna go and browse, but there are so many effects in here uh, that you are just going to be overwhelmed, especially for the first time. So I'm just gonna guide you with just a few of them, but in the case of this, 
I'm just going to show you one effect, and that's called Grid. And what this effect is going to do is create a grid, as you can imagine, but with an alpha channel, which is really nice. So go to the one under Generate, and we're just going to drag this on here like this, and we get ourselves a grid. Not very exciting, I know, but here we go. We're going to go down, and we're going to go change this. If you can't find where this Effects panel is, go to Window, and then go to Effects Control, which is in the sort of second panel here. Uh, that'll just be right here, and it should pop up somewhere. All right, let's change this to width and slider. We'll make this just a little bit smaller now. That's a little bit too small. And we'll make the width or the border something like two, just something a little bit thinner. And we'll try to make it so that it's, uh, you know, see those edges and the lines, see if we can get these lines to actually line up to the top here as best as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it would be nice. Actually, let's make this just a teeny bit bigger. I think because in the, in the 80s, I used to make these grid lines just a teeny bit bigger. All right, here we go. Not super important, but nice. All right, here we go. We're going to change the color of this to uh, maybe a really hot, sort of hot, hot purple. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is we are going to do this thing called pre-composing. Now, if you think of your composition like a box, pre-composing is like putting elements that are in your box into smaller boxes so that it's easier to move things around in groups. So let's put our grid into a pre-composition. First, we'll go up to Layer, and then go to Pre-Compose. And it gives you two options here, Leave All Attributes in Background, or Move Attributes in New Composition. Now, by default, it'll go Leave, but we're actually going to move all. Now, just to explain this, Leave All Attributes is like putting our solid in a box without the effects applied to it, which in this case is the grid effect. Now, Move All Attributes places a solid inside the box with the effects. Both properties have different uses at different times, which you'll understand once you start using After Effects more. Now we'll rename this one animation as we will be doing some animation on it a bit later. Click OK. So right now that's not very exciting, but we have basically turned this into a grid uh, that we can move around and you can just drag this object around like this. All right, so let's turn this into a 3D layer and actually make it a floor if you like. So. There are a bunch of switches here that you can't see. Some of you may or may not be able to see it, which is fine. Um, by default, you might actually see it. It might look like something like this. Uh, let me see if I can get it to look. It might look like something like this. You might not be able to see where the 3D is. But if you go down here, there's a whole bunch of switches you can actually muck around with down here. Alternatively, you can go to uh, right click in these where it says mode or any of these like in here on this top line and just go columns and go for switches. And then you'll see this. So you might not see it, but if you right click on switches, go columns and then go switches, you'll be able to see it there. And this row here is what turns objects into 3D objects. So right now everything is only 2D. And if you check the transform properties, so if we twirl down and twirl down, if you check the transform properties, you can see it's only two coordinates, so it's only 2D. Now every object here is a 2D object, as you can see if I twirl down, if you get past the contents, there is a transform here and 2D, 2D. But right now we're going to turn this into a 3D object. So I'll leave this one open just so you can see the difference. Now, if you go up to this box here where it's a cube, I know very 3D, it'll actually turn that into a 3D and watch this. This little gizmo appears, which is fantastic and which allows us to move things around in 3D. So it also gives you these little handles where you can pull things around like this or, oh, looks like the pole bow coming for me. You can pull these handles around like this so you can get, you know, into the 3D. There's also one behind, which you can't really see, but it is there. And likewise, as you start rotating, you can see that it starts becoming 3D, which is something that we didn't have before. As you can see, now there are three coordinates as opposed to two coordinates. All right, so let's spin this down. Let's turn this down uh, to 90 degrees. I'm actually gonna type it in. So you can actually highlight it and type minus 90. There we go, the grid has disappeared, but no, it is still there. It's just that it's flat to us. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab this Z. So drag, drag the, uh, grab the arrow selection tool, and then we'll just go to the, where it says Z or Z in America, and then drag it down. And as you can see, we are creating a little floor plane. And that is fantastic. And that's all we want. And so there we go. Now, as you can see here, the grid is, it's not bad, but as you can see here, it doesn't quite 
go to the very edges of the frame. You can see it's like, maybe that's what you want. Maybe that's okay with you. But to me, I would like it to actually expand a little bit further left and right. So there is a, a effect that we can throw on here, which will exp expand the edges of our canvas for us. And that's called motion tile. We're going to go to the effects and presets one more time and type in motion, uh, motion. Oops, if I can type motion, motion. And you can see here under stylize, we've got this thing called motion tile. So let's drag that on here like this. And uh, you'll be greeted with this little panel here. Now we're gonna output width and output height. So we're gonna actually expand the width just a little bit. As you can see, I only did a little bit, but it expanded the width quite a fair bit. And there we go. We've expanded the edges of the frame somewhat. So there we go. That is uh, basically our almost our scene set up. Now, just to add a few little extra things on here, I'm actually going to mask out the top of this uh, little little thing here. So it looks like it dithers into the background. So here we go. I'm going to select this. While this is selected, I'm going to select this tool. Now, this is the rectangle tool. Now, we used it to draw shapes, but we can also use it to draw masks. So and it, that depends on the context you're using it in. So let's highlight this now and let's draw a mask. Now it's gonna do something weird because it is in 3D. So it's drawing it like it's in a 3D space. So just watch this. See how it's kind of like a 3D. Uh, it's already in 3D. That's because of the way, because the object is a 3D and it's taken into account it is a 3D object. All right, so now we've created a mask and as you can see, we've just chopped it here, which just doesn't look very good at all. Now what we can do is we can go and change the, now this mask will pop up, but if you haven't got it, you can always twirl down and look for the mask itself or you can press the letter M and that'll bring the mask up as well. And you can mark around with the mask properties from here. Now it is set on add. Uh, we can set it to subtract, so it actually goes the other direction. Now, right now, you can see that it chops off whatever we've, we've it subtracted, whatever's at the top here. What we would like to do, though, is to kind of feather this edge so it kind of fades off into the distance. So as you can see here, we've got a mask feather tool here. Now, the mask feather tool has two coordinates. It'll wear the feather on the, on the X and the Y axis. So this first coordinate is the X axis, and this will feather on the Y axis or the vertical and the horizontal. So right now we just want to feather on this axis here, which is what I would call the Y axis. I know it's not very intuitive, but that's what it is. So we're going to uncheck this and then we're just going to feather this. We're just going to increase the feather on this. And there we go. It is feathering as dithering into the distance. Now, if you want to check this out a little bit closer, you can use the mouse wheel or you can use the comma and the full stop, which is next to the letter M to actually get closer to see where things are. Now, as you can see, I've zoomed in, but it's not in the right position. I wanna go down and have a look to see what's down there. So if you hold down spacebar, it'll bring up this thing called the hand tool. And as you can see up here, the hand tool was selected. This is a non-destructive tool. It's just a way for you to view what's going on in the canvas. So we hold down spacebar and then we start dragging up. We can actually drag this viewer so we can see what's happening a bit better. As you can see, the feather looks pretty good. Um, we can hold down the space bar again and drag around to see what is going on so we can zoom in and really get into those details to see that everything is looking correct and that is great. Now I'm going to use this, the zoom wheel to zoom out again, uh, the scroll wheel to zoom out again and as you can see we can get back to where we are. Otherwise you can just go to here at the bottom of the composition window and just go fit and you just can see what's happening there. All right, so the next part of this tutorial is actually about animation, and we're just gonna animate this scene just a little bit. But before we get started, I just need to quickly explain what keyframes are. So what are keyframes? Well, think of keyframes like a GPS coordinate where you tell the computer, I wanna start here and I wanna end here, and the computer has to figure out how to do that in animation. So in this instance, we're gonna to go to the very beginning of the timeline, and we're gonna bring up the position property, and so if you twirl down and go to position, you can see this little stopwatch here. So we're gonna set our first GPS coordinate or keyframe and then click on the stopwatch here. Now, if you're curious how I managed to move the timeline to the beginning, if you go to this top section of the timeline here where my arrow is, you can actually bring up the scrubber and that allows you to move forward and backwards on the timeline. Now, if we go to the second around two seconds and set another position keyframe, you can click on the second diamond here. See, you can't click on the button again. If you click on this again, it'll actually delete all the keyframes, but we're not gonna do that. We're gonna click on this one here, which is add or remove keyframes, which is next to the position. So let's click that. 
And right now, nothing is happening because the two GPS coordinates are exactly the same. So what we want to do is actually change the position coordinate of the second GPS point or the second keyframe point and move it somewhere over here. So let's do that. We're going to scrub all the way here till we get to this keyframe and then we're going to bring it all the way over here. And right now, as you can see, the computer is actually figuring out the best route to get from this point to this point. So if we press play, you'll see what happens. It actually does what it's supposed to do. So if you think of keyframes as like GPS coordinates for the computer, that's how you can approach it. So right now, if you see this little diamond come up on the left-hand side of a property, so for example, if I click this, you'll see the diamond come up, it automatically enters keyframe mode, which means that any change that you put on your timeline at any point in time will affect the way the keyframes are interpreted. For example, if I decide to put a keyframe in the middle like this, it'll automatically add a keyframe too. Likewise, if I go to the end here and I decide that I just wanted to move it back to the middle, it'll add another keyframe in here as well. So just be careful that you're not moving things around where you don't want keyframes to appear because they will be added in automatically. And in the case of the tutorial that we're going to be doing, that's the method we're going to use. We're going to start with one keyframe and then move to where we want the keyframe to end and actually move it to the position that we want. And as you can see, the keyframe gets added automatically. And with that, let's start animating our scene. So we're going to set a first keyframe, which is basically the mountain moving up. So we're going to go to the beginning of this and we're going to go to the position and we're going to set a keyframe under the position, hit the stopwatch and that's one keyframe. You can see the little diamonds that come up are the keyframes. And then we're going to go to the last point and we're going to bring, we're going to go and highlight this and we're just going to drag it up or you can actually set the coordinates here, but we're going to drag this up and there we go. And like this, we're just moving in a straight line. So that looks like the mountain is rising. Likewise with the sun, we're going to do something similar, but instead of going straight up, we're going to make it arc a little bit like in a diagonal position. So let's press P as a shortcut to bring up the position. We're going to set a keyframe at the beginning. Again, if you want to navigate to the beginning of the, of the composition, just drag this scrubber here, which is where you uh, uh, basically look backwards and forwards in the timeline, drag it to the beginning and now drag it to the end. And let's move, we're going to use the arrow tool this time, the selection tool, and actually drag it up this way. As you can kind of see, it's making a sort of diagonal line like this, which is perfect for us. And then we can see which way it's moving. And that's not looking too bad at all. So here you go, we've created two bits of keyframe animation. All right, and the last bit of animation we're going to go is the grid. And we're going to make the grid move as it's going. And in from top to bottom basically. So we're going to click into the grid animation here. And this is a pre-composition, so it's going to bring us into another composition. So here we go, double click on the grid animation. Here we are. Now click on the solid. And now we're going to go to the effects grid. Now if you can't see this grid anim uh, this grid effect, you just need to highlight that and then it'll come up. And now we're going to animate the anchor point here. So if you can see here, this anchor point, actually, if you move this anchor point, it actually moves this around for us, but it's like a infinite grid loop, which is fantastic. So that's what we want to do. So if you twirl down here and go to effects and go to grid, we're going to set a keyframe on the anchor at the beginning of the, of the composition and then go to the very end. And then we're going to drag this to the left and just make it move just a little bit. Now, if you want to see the speed of this, we can go to the beginning and press spacebar and just see how long it takes to get up there. Now, I probably want this just to be a teensy bit faster, so we're going to move this just a little bit more so that it travels more distance in a shorter amount of time. And that's not looking too bad. All right, so let's go back to the background. So you can go up here where it says grid animation and then go to background. Alternatively, you can go back to the project here and go background and that'll bring you back here as well. But you can also go here and up the top here, you can actually go backwards and forwards to any composition that's connected to another composition. You can jump between the two compositions as it were. So here we go. There we go. You created your first animation and your first background. Well done. 
Now guys, we're gonna stop for a second and talk about our sponsor, and that is Envato Elements. Now, why do I use Envato Elements? Well, it's super useful to getting you out of a jam more than you think. I kind of think of it like a cheat code for basically video editing. If you have clients who need stuff turned around really quickly, this is where something like Envato Elements comes in clutch. Actually, just recently, I did a job where I needed to turn around and edit in one day. I didn't have any time to go and shoot anything. I just had to find some stock footage straight away. And what's great about Envato is that because it's unlimited downloads, you can download the stock you like, and if it doesn't work out, you can go get another piece of stock, and you can keep doing that over and over again until you find the stock that you really want. Once you sign up, there's very little risk of you downloading something that you didn't really need, which is what the traditional model of a lot of stock sites were. This is where you can download thousands of templates to try out, and you can see which one suits you. So guys, we've managed to secure a seven day free trial for you guys to check out today. So go to the description, check it out. It really supports the channel. Anyway, let's go back to the tutorial. All right, so you finally created your first animation. Now let's get on to the text. Now, just to do a little bit of housekeeping here to keep things all nice and neat, we're actually gonna put all these things into a different folder. And we're just gonna drag, we're just gonna highlight these things. So you just hold down Command or Control and just drag these into a folder. And we're just gonna call these comps. And there we go, they just kind of keep things nice and neat. And it's important as you become an After Effects artist that you understand how to keep things neat because this can get out of hand. And as Herman says, you want to keep stuff neat. So let's make sure we keep things neat. All right, here we go. We're going to do some text now. So we're going to create the text animation. So let's make a new composition. You can actually come here actually. And rather than right click here and go new composition, you actually come here and go new composition. And we're going to call this text. And then we're gonna dash main or whatever you wanna call it, it's completely fine. We're gonna make it five seconds, pretty much all the same as before. And we're gonna go, okay. All right, I'm gonna show you how to use the text tool. So next to the pen tool here is the text tool. So if you just highlight that, just highlight this bad boy, click somewhere in here, let's type in something, Ula Femi, which is fantastic. Now, that's all good and well, but say you don't like the font, what are you gonna do about it? Well, let's go to this panel here called character. Now, if you don't know where that is, again, go to windows and then go for the window that says character and that'll pop up here, no problems. We're actually gonna make this a different color. I'm actually gonna set this to gray. Um, I'm gonna go for the very lucky Asian number, triple eight twice and make this like middle gray. And um, you can actually play around with the parameters as you like. I'm gonna make this an all caps kind of situation. And I'm also going to um, change the tracking here a little bit to zero so that you know everything is nicely spaced evenly. Um, you can make the font as big or as small as you like. Um, this is, these are just all tr uh, character parameters as you muck around. You can muck around with these to your pleasure, but very similar to pretty much every other program that you've used out there that uses uh, type in any way, shape or form. Okay, so right now this is not centered and that's no good. We need to bring it to the center. Now, there are a couple of ways you could do this. There are a few things down here that we haven't looked at at all. There is this grid pattern that you can choose. If you hold down on the grid pattern, you can kind of see there are a couple options you can choose from. You can have rulers that come on the side here. If you're very familiar with Photoshop, you can drag rulers in and bring them in as, as you like, but we don't need them for right now. In fact, they're really kind of annoying. So I'm gonna drag them straight off. So I'm gonna drag them away from me. Alternatively, you can pull up the title safe and that'll actually give you a set of crosshairs right in the middle there. And we can probably line it up right there to be right dead center. Now, another way you could do this though, is if you have just created your text and you don't wanna use the crosshairs because you know, for whatever reason, there is this thing called the align tool. And so the align tool, again, if you go to windows and go to align, it'll show you these things here. And what you can do is you can actually just go, I'm gonna use the center align and then I'm gonna use the vertical align. And there you go, you're dead center in the composition now, that's where your object is, which is fantastic. And I use this all the time for lots of different things. All right, so right now we're gonna just pre-compose this text and we're just gonna make this the main text. So we're just gonna right click we're just gonna highlight this and go layer and then pre-compose. And then we're just gonna call this text uh, main. I know we just called this text main, but let's call this, actually let's call it, uh, 
Let's just call it text. We'll just call it text. That just makes more sense. So right now, that's just a piece of text inside the text, and that'll be abundantly more clear as we go on. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do now is also, we're gonna set a gradient over the top of this uh, of this text. So let's make a new gradient. Uh, go to the rectangle tool up here, and we're gonna select the rectangle. And we're gonna select the fill and change it to a gradient, like we did before. Um, now let's create a, just say rectangle, as we did before, drag one out. And there we go, fantastic. Now. We don't like these colors because this is not the colors that we're looking for. So again, go to the selection tool and you can see these two little handles that get pulled out again. And so let's adjust these gradients as we did before. Now this time let's pick some slightly different colors. So let's go for, hmm, we'll go for a sort of a darker blue towards the top and maybe sort of a, a warmer blue towards the bottom, but we'll also make it quite bright. So there we go. And that's not too bad. All right, now, what I wanna do though, is I actually just wanna split this gradient into two sections. So what we're gonna do is, I'm actually going to select the scale and and we're gonna to go to the scale properties here and we're just gonna uncheck this and make this 50%. And what's that gonna, what that's gonna do is gonna shrink down my whole shape down to 50% and we're just gonna move this to the top here like this. And that looks pretty good. Actually, I just make, might make this top color just a little bit darker. So I'm just gonna select this again. And let's see, let's make this just a teeny bit darker. I really want that gradient to really shine. You'll see why in a second. All right, so now that we've done that, we're actually gonna duplicate this. So what you can do is you can go highlight this and go edit, and then we're gonna duplicate. And, you, and this is right here. Alternatively, you can press Command D or Control D to actually get that duplication happening as well. And we're just gonna, hold shift and drag this all the way down. So effectively we've created a new instance of that shape tool. Now they're not linked, they're just, it's just a new instance. All right, so let's click, click on the selection tool and let's go down and change the gradient for this one as well. So let's go up here and we'll make this a slightly different color. Let's make this start with a, uh, a different hue. So almost like a, that's like a purpley kind of hue maybe. And then let's go the end color and make this like a, I don't know, let's see, maybe like an orangey, maybe a peachy kind of hue. And that's not too bad. All right, there we go. Those are our two gradient hues that we are muck around with today. You can muck around with this for taste, but that's the one I'm choosing. All right, so now selecting both these things, we'll actually rename them. Let's make this the, let's talk bottom gradient, just so we understand what we're doing because sometimes these things can get a bit confusing top gradient. All right, selecting both these things by holding control or command, we're going to pre-compose both these things into another layer as well. So we're gonna go to layer and then also pre-compose. You guys, you can see here, there is also a shortcut here. It should be shift command C if you're on a Mac or on a PC, it's control shift C. So there we go. And let's call this gradient one and then go okay. Now. There we go, nothing's happened, but that's just because we've moved everything into here. All right, so let's shrink this down so it's actually, so as you can see here, there are little handles on the edge of these things. If you can't see these things, they should be coming up. You need to check this box here, there's a toggle mask and shape path visibility. That'll become up and disappear as you select that, but just select that. And we're gonna hold down shift as we're doing it because if you don't hold down shift, things will just get a bit wonky, you know, you just change change the the um the scale of things as they like if you want to see what's actually happening here if you go to transform you can see the scale property here we're going to hold down scale so it scales proportionately just so it covers the you know around the height of the uh of of the text that we're looking at here so just roughly around there try and get it as close as you can again i'm using the scroll wheel to get in closer alternatively you can use the comma or plus uh comma or full stop to um zoom in and zoom out on the keyboard as you like all right here we go now that covers it fine but we want to actually get it to it covers the very edge of the frame and we actually want it to go all the way to the edge so what we can do again is go to effects and presets and we've actually had motion tile selected but if you want to type it in again we'll type in motion motion tile and we'll just drag that down onto this 
and we'll just expand the width again so it just becomes a continuous gradient like that. All right, so that's great, but now what? So I'm gonna introduce you to a new thing called mats. Now, if you're familiar with Photoshop, you understand what mats are, but effectively what happens is that we want the gradient to inherit the shape of the text. So if you can imagine, um, we only want the gradient to be visible when the, where the text is visible. So what we need to do is grab the gradient and then we'll put it below the text and we'll have the text on top. And what we're gonna do is when we turn this little switch on, which is called the track mat. Now, if you can't find the word track mat, just go up here to where one of these things are and right click in here and then go to modes and that'll just pop up. Now we're gonna select alpha mat. And what it's gonna do is this bottom layer is going to inherit the alpha channel of the top layer or effectively just take on what is visible. So whatever is visible in the top layer will only be visible in the bottom layer. So let's do that. Give it a sec and there we go. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is add a bevel to the text. So we're gonna select our text layer and we're gonna duplicate this. So Command D or Control D to actually duplicate these things and then we're gonna turn it on. Now what we can do here is we can go to the effects thing and type in bevel and we're gonna look for bevel alpha and there we go, we're gonna bring this on here. And what it'll do by default is actually add some great bevel to our scene. We're actually gonna bring the bevel so it's a bit closer to the top. We muck around the angle, uh, the light intensity. I'm gonna bring the light intensity all the way up and maybe just make it a tad thicker. And that is great. Now the reason why we made the text green, oh, so gray, did I say green? Gray, is because when you select the transfer mode here, now, transfer mode is a special way to combine a layer with all the layers below it. Uh, different modes will give different results. In this case, we're going to select overlay because that keys out the gray in the text and just gives us the bevel edges. So let's do that. We're gonna to go to overlay, as you can see here, and it adds a nice little bevel to the scene, as you can see. Now, we're just going to muck around with the lighting here just so that it just kind of gives us what we want. And I think that looks pretty nice. Now we're gonna do this one more time. We're gonna we're gonna duplicate this with the uh, effects on it, the bevel alpha channel. As you can see here, it's got bevel alpha on it. So we're gonna duplicate this one more time. And we're gonna actually muck around with the angle again so we get like a bit of a, an opposite angle. So let's just really bring it down here. And as you can see, gives you a little bit of a more dimensionality on the object itself. So I'll just show you with, with and without. So that's without the extra bevel. And with the extra bevel, it just gives a little bit of edge to the bottom here as well. All right, so we're gonna duplicate this one more time. So let's, let's rename this. So this is text uh, bevel one, and then we're gonna write bevel two. And then we're gonna rename this text gradient. All right, so let's duplicate this one more time and then we're gonna bring this to the bottom this time. And we're gonna bring it right down the bottom here. And we're actually gonna take the effect off this one so we don't need this effect anymore. So if you scroll down and go for the effect and go delete. Now we're gonna do a little bit something a bit funky here. So what we're gonna try here is add a layer style. So if you right click on the text, and if you're very familiar with Photoshop, you'll know exactly what I'm doing. But we're gonna right click here and go for the layer style. And here we're going to add a stroke to this. And if we're just gonna highlight, as you can see here, it is red and that's kind of not what we want, but we do want the stroke, but it doesn't really matter what the color is. We're just gonna increase the stroke just stroke just a little bit. And uh, just so that's just, you know, right right on those edges there. So you can see here, it's very, very 80s. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do too is just to muck around with this just a little bit. And I realize this is probably the best way of doing it is if you go to the project here and we've got our gradient one, we're actually gonna duplicate that. So effect, and we're gonna duplicate gradient one and make it gradient two. Now this is a new instance, so you can actually go into gradient. So if you try changing something in gradient two, it's not gonna affect anything in gradient one, which is fantastic. So we created a new instance. So let's uh, double click into gradient two and see what we can do with it. Now we've got these things here. Now what I wanna do actually is I actually want to rotate these things uh, around. So um, what we can do up here is we can actually go to the 
gradient tool and ah, so to the gradient and we'll just rotate these around. Alternatively, you can come up here and we just want to flip these colors around. So we want the dark blue to be at the bottom and the light blue to be at the top. Now you could go through and actually just change the gradient itself, but I'm actually going to do it a slightly easier way. We're just going to go transform. We're going to right click it in and go transform and then go flip vertical. And then likewise with this, I'm going to transform and then flip vertical. And there we go. That is it upside down. Now let's go back to our composition, which was text main. And let's drag on gradient two onto this, um, below the text, below the text layer. And likewise, we are going to shrink this down, hold down shift and shrink this down. So it's roughly about the size of the text, the height of the text. If it's too small, it'll actually start to clip. So we don't want that. And we're just going to go to the Mo the effects on this one, and we're just going to copy this motion tile because it is exactly the same. We're going to copy it like pre by pressing Control C or Command C, copy, and then we're going to go here and we're going to go paste it on, and it'll actually paste that effect on, and we've got very similar things. And likewise, as we did with the gradient on this one, we're going to try and punch out a very similar alpha channel with this text layer. And so we're going to go, okay, oh, we need to turn off the overlay on this as well. So let's turn off overlay and make it normal. Um, and let's change this to alpha and then there we go. Give it a sec. And there we go. We've got a very juicy looking text, uh, outline on there. I think that actually looks a little bit too thick. So I'm actually going to dial down the layer style just a touch. Um, so if we go up here to the text, to this text layer, we can actually dial down this size. You can actually twirl down on this. Now I probably should rename this because that makes sense. It's also important to note that renaming your layers doesn't actually change the layer themselves. They're still all referencing the same layer. The reason why we are renaming everything is so we can keep track of what's going on, especially when we go and dive into the project at a later date. Trust me, it'll save you so much time. Fantastic. That's looking very retro, I think. So the last thing we're going to do is add a text sheen to the top of this. So we're going to duplicate this text gradient layer and we're going to bring it to the top to do control D or command D and bring it to the top here. And as you can see, it's just that color there. And we're going to add a animated mask. So we'll highlight this text and we'll rename it text sheen. And uh, we'll go to the try the rectangle tool up here and we'll select it. And we're just going to draw a rectangle, a really long rectangle, something like that. It's kind of nice and thin, whatever you like, and make it about there. And um, we're just going to drag, we're going to grab this arrow tool after we've made that rectangle, and we're just going to select, sorry, we're going to hold down shift and select on these two points and just drag them across like this. Alternatively, you can just come up here and muck around with the mask path yourself. I like, if you hold shift, It'll allow you to uh, select and unselect the points itself. So if you go, okay, so if you've got everything selected, for example, like this, and you just want to select the one point, hold down shift, and that'll unselect one, and then you can go back and reselect these things. That's kind of the way I like to do it. All right, so we can animate this mask. So again, using the keyframes that we learned earlier, we can set a, a keyframe here. And uh, as you can see, I set a keyframe in the middle here, which is no good, but you can actually, because this is ref because we've got the keyframe referencing this point in time, uh, if you if you select everything and then drag it here, it'll actually make the keyframe start from here. And then if we go to the end here and then double click on this, so we get a bounding box, we can actually drag everything across. Hold down shift, we can bring everything across. Actually, let's make it go all the way to the very edge of the screen because I'll show you why in a second. There we go. So what's happening now, if we press play, you can see that a sheen goes across, but that's too slow. So let's make it a little bit faster. Let's make it start at one second. And then we'll make it end at around two and a half seconds, somewhere around there. Let's see, that, let's see how that looks. Okay, that's great. However, this looks gray, which is not right. So let's make this a different color. So we're gonna make this white. And so the way we do that is we grab another effect and we're gonna call this one fill. Well, we didn't call it, it's actually called fill. And under generate, there's this drag fill onto the top here. Ha, fill, sounds like I'm talking about a dude. Drag fill, and we're gonna change the fill color to white. And then let's have a look at this one more time. 
Actually, that doesn't look too bad. Now, if you want, you can actually muck around with the feathering of this uh, mask as well. If you want to make it a little bit more like a, a softer glow, we don't have to. But, you know, I kind of like the, the hardness of it all, but... It's up to you. That's completely your preference. Now, the last thing we want to do is actually animate the text coming up out of the ground. So let's try that. So let's jump into the text. And this is what's kind of cool about this. Now that we've set everything with the text, we can actually jump into these texts. And these, although we have renamed these text layers, these are all referencing the same piece of text. So let me show you what I mean. If I jump into this piece of text here, we can name this something else. So if I type my name, Nick Koo, if we come back to the original text, everything is updated and it doesn't matter what you do to it, it doesn't matter. And that's why I said I wanted to make the, the mask animate off frame because my name's a little bit wider than the Ulafemi name. So it'll actually cover the whole screen regardless of what we do. Now, obviously there's a cap on how big we can make the word, but you can muck around with these things to, you know, to your preference. But let's set it back to Ulafemi just for now. Okay, there we go. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have the uh, the animate the text actually rise out of the bottom. And like I said before, what we're going to do is use a different technique using the alpha mats that we said before. So in this case, you can use alpha mats to actually hide things. So let me show you what I mean. So in this instance, we're going to create a new shape here. And so we go to the rectangle tool. We're going to change the fill to a solid. It doesn't really matter in this instance, but I'm just going to use it just so it makes it a little bit easier. And if you can imagine, I'm going to create an area where the text will be visible when the solid is above it and invisible when it's not. So let's say I'm going to draw a text, uh, a rectangle here like this, right up to the very edge of where the text is at the bottom here. Now you can move that around if you haven't got it quite right, just move it around so it's there. So it does cover the top half of the text so it doesn't, it's not visible. All right, so if we using that, what I'm going to tell this what I'm going to tell this text to do is that it's only visible in the blue areas and invisible where there isn't any blue. So, if you go here and go to alpha mat, this is what happens. Nothing happens, but that's okay. But what I've effectively done is that remember when I said everything that is blue, which is this area here will be visible, everything that's outside the blue will it'll be invisible. So check this out. When I drag it down, it starts to disappear and that's kind of cool and that's what we kind of want so if you press p to bring up the position and we set a keyframe right here we'll go to the beginning and then we'll set a keyframe so it's outside of the area of the blue and hold down shift while you're doing it so it goes straight down now when we press play it sort of looks like it's rising out of the ground now there's a little bit of a thunk when it sort of comes out of the ground, which is not the end of the world, but I don't particularly like that. And that has to do with the fact that these are just, uh, it's just using a constant speed and there's no like uh, sort of easing to the to the edge of the frame. And we can probably fix that by just going, right clicking on that particular keyframe and go keyframe assistant and go easy ease. And that'll just make things a little bit nicer. And there we go. Now, if we come back here, you can have a look and see what how this actually plays out. So if we press play and press spacebar, not bad, not bad at all. All right, so we've done our text animation and we've done our background animation. Now let's do a little bit of housekeeping just to make sure that we're keeping everything all organized. So right now, we're, the only main things we need to look at are the background and the main text. So we're gonna keep those outside. But the rest of these things are what I would call pre-comps, which are just things that we've sort of used as elements within our scene. Now I was just highlighting these actual elements. Like if you wanna highlight a group of things, you can hold down shift and actually drag a whole bunch of them out. Otherwise you can just hold down command or control. And then we'll drag these into another folder and we'll call this pre-comps just to keep things a little bit neat and tidy. And there we go, our main background, our main elements are here. Let's have a look how we're going anyway. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna drag this background into a new comp and let's rename this. It actually creates a background called background two, but we'll call this retro title comp. And uh, the background is in there. Let's drag our main text in there as well. And let's see how this all looks together at the moment. That doesn't look too bad. Not bad at all. All right. Now let's create the last bit, which is basically the the scratchy text, which is like the complementary text or the secondary text that we had at the bottom. So let's create a new composition and we'll call this 
sec we'll call this text secondary now this one we probably don't have to do as much work but we'll just i'll just take it through it anyway i found this really fun text we'll just bring this into the comps window as well um we'll just i'm just gonna there's a really fun font i found called road rage which you can probably use um and this sort of really gives you the right vibe i think all right, so we're just going to bring this to the middle here. We're going to use the align tool to bring everything into the middle again. Um, I'm going to look up the character and I'm going to look for the effect road rage. I thought that looked pretty nice. I'm going to uncheck the all caps because I think it actually looks better as a non caps thing. I'm going to bring it down just a touch. It doesn't need to be as big. Let's create another gradient. Now, this is going to be super easy. We're going to use the same technique that we did before. We're going to up here, go to fill, go to gradient. Let's create that gradient. We're going to select a box. In this case, we'll just select it or just around the text that we've got here. We know it's not going to be not such a big deal. We're just going to do a lazy one here, something like this, and then like this. And then we're going to make this top color maybe a bit warmer, something like a warmer red. And then the bottom color more like an orangey sunset, similar to what we had to the sun before. There we go. Okay. Like I was to bring this below and we'll select this and go alpha mat. And there we go. That's pretty much it. All right. So secondary text is already done. So let's bring this all together and go back to our retro title comp and let's bring the secondary text in here like this and just shrink this down and then we'll rotate it. So if you go to press W, you can actually bring out the rotation tool um, and that'll actually give you this little widgety thing like this. Alternatively, you can press R to bring out the rotation and just go, wee. Now I actually think that the, uh, I'm actually gonna turn it just something like this. I actually think the text is a bit small, so I'm just bring it just a teeny bit larger than that. Not bad. Now what we're gonna do is, now it's not a very exciting text here. I'm actually gonna change the, the kerning of this just a touch so that maybe, is it kerning, tracking? I don't really know which one it is. I'm actually gonna select this bottom one here and I'm just gonna make this, change this slight one slightly so it's just slightly more there. And there we go. That's what I kind of like about it. Maybe I'll just make this just a little bit less, less ugly. Now I actually want this to appear like a, after, after it's appeared, so somewhere around there. So we're actually gonna start the secondary text somewhere around the one second mark. So it's not gonna be there until the one second mark. So what you can do, just like in Premiere, just drag it across so it is just there. And then we're just gonna go, okay, bang. That's what we're gonna do, bang. Now it looks a bit dumb that it's a bit derpy that it just sort of just appears out of nowhere. So we're gonna add a little bit of animation to it. So we're gonna bring the scale up. Um, so press S for scale, or if you want, just go to the, rotate, the transform properties. For some reason, if you don't have the S key to press, but if you've got the S key, just press S to bring the S key up. Now we're gonna set a keyframe, uh, maybe around the 112 mark, uh, we'll set one keyframe there, so that's where it's gonna rest, but we're also gonna put a keyframe at the beginning here. It's gonna scale down really, really, uh, what do you call, subtly, if you like. So let's scale this up just a touch. I'm gonna hold down the Apple or the control key, sorry, the command or control key just to give me a bit more precision when I do this. And so what's gonna happen is it's gonna do this. And so when it appears, it comes down like that. That's a little bit too slow. So I'm gonna bring this a little bit closer. And like I said before, we're gonna press F9 to bring up the ease, uh, to put an ease on it. Now, if you don't know where the F9 key is, don't worry. You can just go to a keyframe assistant and go easy ease. And then that's going to make things go down like that. And that still looks a little bit derpy. There's nothing happening here, but to really emphasize the point, we're gonna go in here and go left click and go new solid. And we're gonna make this one black. So let's go here. Make sure all these details are the same. If you want, just press make comp size if you're not really sure. And we're gonna call this lens flare. So we're gonna go here. We're gonna bring this here just like around just before this occurs. So the lens flare is gonna start there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the effects and presets and we're gonna type in lens flare. Now this lens flare is pretty ugly but it's the built-in one and it can be usable, but it is pretty ugly. So let's drag it on. And I can see, you can see we've got this funky little lens flare. See a little crosshair here. You can kind of move, move it around, muck around with it here. Otherwise you can go up here and you can actually, you know, drag it to where you like. But we're not gonna use this particular one. We're gonna use a different one. So let's change it to this 105 prime. I like the color of this one a bit more. 
And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to animate the brightness. So actually, let's bring this just a little bit further up so it starts a bit further here. So let's set some keyframes for the brightness. Um, it's going to be the brightest here when it just occurs. So we'll make the flare like pretty bright. So let's turn it up so it almost fills the screen about there. And let's set a keyframe. You can actually set keyframes up here. Um, where the stopwatch is so we can set a keyframe there now that is reflected down here on this panel Here as well, so you can kind of see there we go We've got a keyframe already set from the one we set up there Well, let's go to the beginning and let's set the brightness of the flare to zero so it starts at zero and so right now you can see it zooms up and then it's going to we're going to set another keyframe so it goes back down to zero and so what's going to happen is that it'll go up and then come down. And it's very, very subtle. We might actually make it even shorter than that. Um, I'm actually going to shrink this back just a little bit. There we go. So I'm actually going to cut this layer off at the bottom here, at the back here. Now, as you can see here, I am actually a little bit having trouble actually getting to the edge. And then normally you would actually drag the edge back to do that. But that's... That is, when I started out, that was a really annoying thing to have to do, and I didn't like doing that. Now, uh, since then, there's a much easier way. And so if you select this and go edit, and then go up here to split layer, it's shift command D or shift control D. If you split the layer, it'll actually split the layer where the marker is. And then you just highlight the layer you don't want and just delete it, and that's it. Now, obviously, this is just on black, and you're probably wondering, why is it on black? Well, what we can do here is we'll go to the transfer mode, which is up here. Now, if you don't know where transfer mode is, again, go to columns, go to modes, and you've got a whole bunch of these transfer modes, just like you do in Photoshop and in Premiere. Now, I'm going to set this one to add. As you can see here, it's just going to animate over the top. And there you go. Now, as you can see here, the flare probably should come down the bottom here where the text is. So let's set the the center of the flare to actually be here. You can actually animate this flare as well, like as in the position of the flare, just like we have everything else. But in this particular case, I don't think we need to. So let's see how this animates on. Bam. A little bit nicer, isn't it? There we go. Boom. All right, so that's the animation in a nutshell. Now, there are a couple little things here I probably want to do just to make it a little bit more 80s. Um, now, this is all very flat. So let's go into the background layer and let's see if we can add a little bit more dimension to the objects themselves. Now, the sun itself, uh, I think, should be glowing. So let's add a little bit of a glow to the background sun. So if we go here and type glow, we can actually grab a glow under stylize and just put it on top. Now, not much happens, but let's see if we can improve that just a little bit. We can actually increase the radius just a touch. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong thing. That's why it didn't work. Let's go to glow, drag it onto the sun this time, and let's increase the radius just a touch. There we go. Increase, we'll muck around with the, uh, the glow threshold. This plugin is not my favorite for glows, unfortunately. I think it is not a great plugin generally for glowing. It's very basic. Um, you can add an extra one on top to kind of muck around with like what you feel is appropriate. But again, I find this very uncontrollable and not my favorite glow plugin at all. But uh, it is what we have built into this thing. But it might take a little bit of time to kind of muck around with what you do. Um, if you have the money, and I suggest if you have the money and you really want to get to put more glows into your things, there is a much better plugin called Deep Glow. It's not overly expensive, but it is very, very good. And it is uh, makes things glow a lot nicer, as you can see the difference between the two. But if you can't afford it, or if you're just starting out and you're not sure if you want to get into After Effects, Glow is what you want to use, but again, not my favorite thing. And uh, I would probably suggest something else if you can help it, but there you go. Uh, we have that glowing as well. And I'm going to put a glow onto our... Now, I went back up a title. I'm going to put a glow onto this layer as well. And uh, let's go put a glow on this. And again, you just have to muck around with this to kind of get it to where you want. I'm going to increase the glow radius just a touch. Um, threshold just a little bit, just so that it affects a bit more of what's going on. There you go. Not bad. Now, we're just going to add a little bit of dimensionality to the actual picture itself. So let's add another solid as well. So let's go to edit and then, sorry, go to layer and then go solid. And we're going to add a little vignette around. There's basically like a dark border around the edge to kind of make it feel a little bit more 
focused in the middle. And so it just gives you a black solid here. We're going to go to the circle tool and we're just going to draw out a circle. Now holding down shift, uh, while this black is selected, we can drag out a circle like this and try and get it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just somewhere in the middle is kind of good. Now we're going to invert the selection here and we're going to go down to the mask properties here and we're just going to feather this yeah, around 500 or 600. There you go. And we'll just expand it out just a touch just so we've got a bit more, uh, just a bit more on the edges there. And that's not looking too bad. So if we press play, there you go. Your retro tutorial. So what's great about this? Well, now that you've set everything up, it's super easy to go back and change things for the way you want. So for example, let's go to the main tool. We'll go to this text tool. And like I said, you can just change the name. Um, you know, maybe I want to call it Nick Koo. And then we go back and then... Or maybe, or maybe you want to change the font as well. Now this might be a little bit trickier, but you can do this. So let's... I think there's a different font you can choose, which is uh, Desta, which is also kind of fun. Uh, let's try this one. This is looking a lot more retro. We can actually make that just a little bit bigger. And so you can have a lot more fun with uh, the way you want to play with these parameters because everything has been set up so you don't have to choose too many things uh, to kind of get things to be fixed if that makes, you know, you don't have to muck around with too many things. And, you know, you can change the colors of your gradients, for example. Uh, if you don't like the colors of your gradient, you can always go through and go, okay, actually, I want to make this a bit more of a purpley vibe rather than a peach vibe. So let's go with, um, again, let's go with magenta. Magenta is always a winner, isn't it? Um, there we go, magenta. And we'll make this a, a darker purple just to kind of really change things up just a touch. There you go. That's, that's definitely looking a lot more retro in its vibe. I would say so. That makes this very easy to muck around with. Now we've got our logo done and that's really nice. Now we're going to really throw it over the top and really add some VHS elements to it to really go for that full on retro vibe. So what I like to do is go to Envato Elements and look for some stock footage that is like VHS stock footage. Um, the real thing always looks a lot better than trying to generate it yourself. You can generate VHS noise in After Effects, but it doesn't look as good as the real thing. So I found one here, which looks pretty good. So what we're going to do is grab our piece of VHS footage and bring it onto the timeline like this. And as you can see, if you use the scroll wheel, you can see it's actually bigger than what we need it to be. So let's scale that down. Holding down shift and grab the edges, we're going to shrink this all the way down. Otherwise, you can just use the scale property if you can remember what that is. Do you remember what it is? It's S. All right, good job. Now, as you can see here, the when we press play on the space bar, we can see that the footage sort of goes to a sort of muddy gray and that's, we want it to be black um, in those gray areas. So what we can do is we're gonna go up to the effects and presets panel up here and we're gonna look for a levels adjustment. Levels basically is a color correction uh, effect that allows us to uh, change the, the black and white levels of an object. So here we go, we're gonna bring it here. As you can see here, there are just a couple sliders here. The only ones you're really gonna to need to know are this one and this one. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drag this one to the end, from the end to the middle, so it becomes black. And this one, we're gonna drag until these little white bits become, these little light bits become white. And that'll make be abundantly clear in a second. So we'll make it as maybe a bit brighter. Now we will adjust this for taste, but if you kind of look here now, it's just a black and white image mostly. All right, that looks pretty good. Now, if we go to the transfer mode, remember transfer modes from this little panel here, the, the way that we, we combine layers together, we're gonna to go to the transfer mode and we're just gonna click on here and we're gonna to go to screen. And what screen does is it knocks out the, the dark areas and just keeps the light areas. So here we go. And there we go. Now, if we press play, you can kind of see what is happening. Now to me, that is a little bit too full on. So we're just gonna muck around with this to kinda uh, get this to be not so extreme. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag the top end of this levels control. So if you highlight the footage again and go to the levels control up here, we are gonna just bring this just down just a touch. 
and we might actually bring this up just a touch. So it's it's not that it's invisible. It's just that we're just going to muck around till it, we kind of get it to a place where I feel like it's a lot more subtle than it is super obvious. So there we go. That's a little bit better. I like it. Yeah, I like that. That looks a lot better. It doesn't look too overpowering and that's what we kind of want. All right, so the next step to really get it to garble and see, as you can see here, it looks cool over the top, but it looks too clean. As you can see, nothing in the background is moving. And if you look at old VHS footage, everything is moving, nothing is still. So the way we can fix that is we're gonna introduce you to this thing called an adjustment layer. So here we go. If you go to the top here under layer, go to new adjustment layer or shift command Y or shift control Y if you're on a PC. And we're just going to drag this below our piece of VHS footage. So what is an adjustment layer? Well, an adjustment layer is a layer that you put on top of everything else. As you can see, I put it here and it doesn't really change anything. But what it is, is an invisible layer that if you put an effect on it, it'll affect everything below it. Let me give you an example. So I'm going to find a fast box blur and we're just gonna drag it straight on to an adjustment layer. Now, nothing happens by default because it is set to zero. But what happens when we turn it up to, for example, 10? Everything below it is blurred. Now that looks kind of cool, but you can see here, the top layer is not blurred because we have it below the VHS footage. But if we move the adjustment layer below, for example, onto the background layer, above the background layer, you can see that the background is now out of focus, but the text on top is not. And likewise, if we drag this layer above the main text layer, the main text layer is out of focus, but the secondary text is not. So that is what an adjustment layer does in a nutshell. So we're gonna move it back up just below the VHS footage. So, because we only wanna affect everything below the VHS. So we're gonna delete this effect and we're gonna start again. All right, so we're gonna go up here to the effects of presets panel and we're gonna look for a an effect called displacement map. And what this does is it allows us to take the black and white image of another piece of footage and remap it onto our footage and distort it in different ways. So in essence, what happens is that it is going to look at the VHS footage. And then if it is a white, if it is a white pixel, it'll move it to the left, to the right. And if it is a black pixel, it will move it to the left. So I'll show you what happens. We're going to set up here. If you go to the displacement map here, I'm going to close down this graphics panel. All right, we're gonna set the displacement map to the VHS footage, which is five. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the horizontal displacement to luminance and the vertical displacement to luminance. All right, and look what happens when we play this back. Now it's very subtle, but you can kind of see the text is all wobbly now. Now we can increase the amount that it actually moves by. So we'll set this to maybe seven and then another seven and see how we go. And as you can see, it is already distorting things quite a lot. That might be a little bit too much. Let me make it a six. Well, let's try this one more time. Looking good. Now to export this out of After Effects so you can post it on your socials or bring it into Premiere. We are nearly at the end, but the final step is to actually export this video out of After Effects so you can post it on the Instagram or put it on your Premiere timeline. So what do we do? First, we select the composition that we want to export. In this case, it's Retro Title Comp. And then we'll go to Composition, and then we have two options here. Add to Media Encoder Queue or Add to Render Queue. We're gonna stick with the second option first because that's a bit easier to explain. So firstly, let's go to Add to Render Queue. So right now you're gonna be met with this window, which is called the render queue. Now at the moment, these settings are garbage. So we're gonna change them right now. So let's go to current settings and go to make template. And right now you're met with this render settings templates. And this is basically where you can set the default options for your render settings. So right now movie default is set on current settings and frame default is set on current settings as well. So what we're gonna do is change them both to best settings and that will fix that issue. And then we're just gonna press okay. Now, we'll just make sure that we select best settings as our default. We're gonna do the same here on output modules. So we'll select the drop down menu and we'll go down to make template. And where it says untitled, we're gonna make our own. So we're gonna call this one ProRes. I think ProRes is a pretty good format. You can decide whatever format you like, but we're just gonna call it ProRes because that's the one I like to use. And we're just gonna press edit. And now we can go in here and I select the format we want. We can go into QuickTime 
and then format options, leave it on RGB, manage the colors, pre-multiply it, and then go format options. And then we'll change the codec to whatever codec you like. I'm going for Apple ProRes 422 LTT. Select that, press OK. And then we'll press OK one more time. And then we'll change the movie default to what we just created, which was ProRes, and then go OK. Now, the last thing you need to do is set where you want this to save. So we'll just click on here. And here it'll bring you into your file structure and select where you want it to be rendered. In this case, this is fine with me. So I'm just going to press save. And then what you have to do is just press render. And you'll hear the After Effects chime and it is ready to go. Now, the second option might be a little bit easier for some people as well, if you want to export directly from After Effects into an MP4, for example. So let's go and select our composition one more time and then go to composition and then go to add to media encoder. This will automatically launch Media Encoder. It might not load as fast as this, but because my uh, After Effects is quite fast, it'll probably do it quite quickly. So you'll be immediately greeted with this window. And these are the default settings that I have when I open Media Encoder. So you can select H.264 or whatever format you decide to use. There is a whole lot of formats you can choose from. I'm gonna just choose H.264. And this is great for web stuff. So if you wanna export something for Instagram, for example, H.264, match source, high bit rate, which is also one of these presets, which is right at the very top. And then again, click in here. You can choose where you want to save it. In this particular case, I'm just going to save it in here. Press save and then press play. And you're done. And that is it. That is exporting from After Effects. All right, guys, you've made it to the end of the tutorial. Well done. Thank you for watching this video. Now, if you have completed a render and tag me, I will repost it on my Instagram feed. I promise you, I want to see what you guys are doing. All right, guys, thanks for watching. And if you want to check out everything that I'm doing on Instagram, check out my handle here. You can what on it, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, thanks for watching, guys. And remember, never use After Effects for editing. Peace.